back to the Hollow Sky Podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Steven. And Kyle. And it is another fun-filled, fabulous Monday morning. We hope we can kickstart your week and get you through it as best as possible. Uh, that being said, special announcement. I don't know if you tuned into the socials, but if you're listening to this on Monday, which should drop the 4th of December, <clears throat> the night shift This month, if you hang out with us live on YouTube, it's normally Wednesday nights, but this month it's going to be Monday nights. So you can join us tonight at 8 p.m. on YouTube. Come and hang out with us, experience the night shift, bring your weirdness. That being said, check us out at all social medias, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Discord, Reddit. Search up the Hollow Sky Podcast and you can come and hang out with us, be part of the Hollow Cult. If you have a listener experience you'd like to share with us for an episode of the listener experience episodes on Thursday, Kyle's got some info that you're going to want. You can write your stories out or record them and shoot them over to the email, which is going to be holoskypodcast at gmail.com. You can also write into the email for interviews or... You can call or text the holophone, which is going to be 618-556-0837. You can send weird shit to Hollow Sky Podcast, P.O. Box 145, Fielden, Illinois, 62031. All this information is in every episode show notes. So if you need a little assistance, instead of running it back a million times, you can go ahead and check the show notes. Although running it back a million times doesn't sound like a bad idea. That's true. Because it might help us out of hair. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Run it back a million times. <clears throat> if you'd like to support the show, plenty of ways to do it. We have a Patreon. You can go over and check that out if you like some extra content or ad free shows. We have our store up at holoskypodcast.com. Go and get some dope merch. Rep the Hollow Cult out in the real world. Um, we have a Venmo. You can throw us some pocket change for some monsters and other nefarious addictions we have. Um, best thing you can do is share the show word of mouth, put the hollow cult name out there, share the episodes, uh, keep it growing, keep it growing. You guys are what make this show and help this show grow. So we appreciate it and keep up the good work. <clears throat> you can also go to wherever you listen to podcasts, your favorite podcatcher, leave us a five-star rating and review, which helps us rise to the top of the old paranormal podcast genre and makes it a little bit easier for people to find cream rises to the top. That's right, baby. That's right. And I'll find your five star rating and review and I'll share it with the show. That being said, our five star rating and review comes to us today from our friend slay your face. That's metal. That is fucking metal. I'm holding up the metal sign while I read this. (laughs) They said, paranormal, 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 five stars. Paranormal, 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 paranormal. Stick with me here. Paranormal, 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 paranormal. Ha ha ha. Take that algorithm. Love you guys. Slay your face. Bro's trying to get us in it. He went hard in the paint there. I love it. Uh, yeah, if you're still here, first off, thanks for the five-star rating and review. Much appreciated. It is. And I think that stems back from when we were talking about the algorithm, like, struggling to pick us up because we don't have, like, paranormal or cryptid or haunting or that kind of stuff in our name. Yeah, maybe. But, I mean, we're not making excuses. No, absolutely not. We're here to grind it. Grind it till you find it. That's what That's what we do. Fake it till you make it. This is exactly what we're doing. So yeah. That's our secret. We're almost five years deep, and we are still have no idea what the hell is going on. Zero. But yeah, keep sending them five stars. We're closing in on a thousand. We're almost at nine hundred just on Apple. I know we're over a thousand in total, just on Apple alone. We're pushing that four digit mark. Let's get Let's us there. Go. So today's. Did I forget anything? I don't think so. We're gonna roll with it. 
today's episode, I have put together another 40 and 50. I know you guys enjoy those. I was flirting with the idea of bringing in kind of a roll the dice thing where we don't go in alphabetical order. I know a lot of people are looking forward to Arizona, so I may do that after Arizona just to kind of mix it up. I don't want people in Washington waiting for, you know, the next 45 years for me to get to the 40 and 50. Well, somebody's going to be waiting 45 years to get to it. So it's me. Just is what it is. Yeah. Alphabetical is a little bit easier to uh, keep track of. Yes. You know what I mean? Very much so. Uh, Arizona was a difficult one because you have a lot of really prominent sort of paranormal things going on there. You have large uh, events. The Phoenix Lights, which is pretty popular. Uh, Travis Walton abduction. Yeah. Um, all the things that go on in Superstition Mountains. Uh, what else is there? There's something else. Uh, but I kind of strayed from those, and I f- tried to find some strange, like one-off encounters and weird kind of off-the-wall 40 and things to throw in here that people may have not have heard of. Uh, I got a bunch of different sources. Paranormal Arizona had some in- encounters. Uh, what is it? Uh, Ron Strickland's Phantom and the Monsters had a good one. And I had a book. I think it's Mysterious America. I can't remember right offhand. But anyway, we're going to dive right into it. 40 and 50, Arizona. The first one, I got some some shorter ones here, and they kind of get longer as we go until the last one. The last one is a big experience I found, and I will do that again last just because. The first uh, story I have here is from a town called Crittenden. Not sure exactly where that is because I've never been to Arizona, but it's an old one. It says in 1891, a lot of newspapers out West carried a story that if true could have massive implications on archeology span and anthropology. Uh, It was first published in the desert weekly from uh, Salt Lake city, Utah talked of a workman in Arizona digging a basement where he said to have found a large clay sarcophagus eight feet below the ground. The container was opened to reveal a mummy that had held a body that was more than 12 feet tall. Wow. Carvings on the case indicated that the man had six fingers and six toes. Giant. Like some other giant remains found in North America. The body had long hair and wore a bird-shaped headdress. The bones had been buried for so long that when the finder tried to touch them, they turned to dust. Again, you have to consider the time that this was put out. A lot of things were written as catchy headlines, you know, but you also hear of stories of giants being found in the Superstition Mountains. I heard, um, I was also hear about um, Egyptian uh hieroglyphs and uh i don't whatever you know i can't think of the word i'm looking for but it's found in the grand canyon which and i bring that up because it correlates with the sarcophagus and you know maybe there's some uh, uh sharing of knowledge in ways that kind of add up you know what i mean yeah it just add it essentially adds the the story that other cultures may have been here well before we ever thought they could be. Right, and the Egyptians may have had influence on giants or vice versa. Like, they obviously may have made contact, or so they aided each other in sharing ways and ideas and stuff like that. Yeah, I was listening to a YouTube video about uh, uh, the Superstition Superstition Mountains, and a man was talking about an experience someone had where they found six like eight or nine foot tall bodies. And uh, in this burial site, there were huge bronze axes with them. So That's awesome. If true, it's not that far-fetched. I'd be trying to drag one of them axes off. <laughs> <It'd> be sick. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely would. Uh, next, we go to the Havasupai Canyon, uh, where a band of rock carvings were found that are very strange. Um uh, 
there is the first one that stands out to the person writing this article was a giant carnivorous dinosaur in these rock carvings, presumably a Tyrannosaurus Rex, which obviously no human should have seen. Should have. And the time these rocks were carved, you wouldn't think that they would have the knowledge put together of said dinosaur. Right. Yeah, I mean that's all. That's all. Presumably, I I wouldn't be surprised to see the human lineage go all the way back then, but it's kind of hard telling. Yeah, I mean dinosaurs vanished millions and millions of years ago, but you hear different cases of there possibly being humans or humanoid entities existing. Then you hear of footprints fossilized in stone, a human footprint where it has a dinosaur footprint overlapping it, essentially stepping on top of it. Right. Which is weird. Which shouldn't happen. No. But it is possible. It says other extinct animals, such as the North American rhinoceros, are more clearly visible. Uh, One figure is undoubtedly some sort of elephantidian, elephantis, probably a mammoth, which seems... (laughs) to be fighting with the humanoid human figure which if it were drawn to scale compared to the mammoth it would be over 10 feet tall Uh, another weird thing about these is that these carvings were over 20 feet above the floor of the canyon that they were found on so you can kind of go two different ways there, that the creek bed in this canyon was much higher than, which kind of leads to essentially maybe how old these carvings are. Right. Or that these carvings were of very tall entities. Or you can go that someone was hanging down from some sort of rope or built ladders to get up there and carve them, which makes you wonder why... They would go through the time to carve them that high. I mean, I guess essentially it could be away from like high water erosion and stuff. If it was, yeah, I feel like Occam's razor there would either be the tall version or the the bed was much higher at that point. Yeah, yeah but it says the only way to reach these figures today are they either be let down by a rope or through the use of, through the use of long ladders. Uh, The pictographs were made by chipping through black scale called desert varnish on the surface of red sandstone. This oxide is extremely slow to form, but has already layered over the pictographs. So it's already showing signs of being there for an exceptionally long time. Next, we go to Tucson, a place called Nine Mile Waterhole, where a person named Charles uh, Manier found a large lead cross while walking about one day in 1924. The cross was buried in a creek embankment where a roadway had been cut through. It also states of uh, these weird five large cylindrical brick ruins that were found. At the time this was written, which was I think it was in the 60s or 70s, they did not have any way to age these weird things, but they thought that it was... They don't know if it was connected to the lead cross or if it was just coincidence that it was found near these big, weird beehive, like, kilns kind of things that they found. But anyway, um, the cross-shaped item had two halves bound together with rivets. When separated, they were found to be covered with dense lines of inscriptions, primarily in Latin, but of a, like, it, it was a weird style. There was also had, like, Hebrew lettering with it so the people trying to translate it were struggling there were also numerous religious and mystical symbols among them were the square and the compass and other emblems found in freemasonry one cross had nothing but a line drawing of what can only be described as a dinosaur so there were multiple crosses here Uh, most of the objects were decidedly bizarre in character with much uh, more symbolism of arcane cults near of the near east than any other sort of mainstream Roman culture. This is particularly true from one of the lead crosses, which had a long snake coiled around it 
an arrow point on top, and a number of engraved Hebrew letters and indecipherable symbols. Um, of course, everybody immediately thought that they were fake. They kind of half pinned it on a local teenager who uh, found one of the crosses because when they were kind of like investigating him, he was big into ancient history. <sighs> that that's I could see how people would perceive it that way. I'm not going to dismiss that. But it could also explain why it was found in the first place. Because say he had done research in the area and oh, went yeah. looking, something to that degree. Um, you would think that like even if he was, like you, that's you'd have to go super deep to do that to to like combine some like Hebrew Latin weird occult esoteric yeah symbolism on these things to try to like dupe somebody and. You know, I know it was found in, in a spot where the road was being cut through, but it could have very easily just been buried along with everything else. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, and I hate the fact that that's the nature of humans right now, and it has been for a long time, but I hate how that's always our go-to. We'll find something cool, and then everybody goes, that's fake. Yeah, it's ridiculous. When you could you could literally just be like, "Hey, Steve, let's take this in. I know we're excited. Let's take this in, make sure it's not a fake. I hope it's not a fake. But let's test it. Let's do the proper tests on this thing to make sure this is real because if this is real, this is going to change the game up a little bit." Yeah. And we're fucking excited about it. But instead, since we don't want to have to change the his the timeline of history, we are going to say that It's fake local hoodlum did it it's just so disappointing to like that we that certain people in the world are that i don't know i don't know if you you'd you'd go with lazy or selfish or vested in history where they're just like no we're not changing it get the fuck out of here yeah it's it's so stupid it is so stupid. It is. It should be. It should be exciting. Yeah. And it should be like an open science. Like you. Yes. If something comes up to where you have to change it, guess what? You got to fucking change That's it. the name of the game. Yeah. That's literally the name. It's, it's literally no different with anything else. Finding new evidence. Cause it's, it'd be like, it would be like some major company having a new operating system built for them. Apple, for example. And then going, uh, No. We're sticking with the old stuff, and the new people are like, but this is so much better. It's faster. It's more re reliable. It's It's got all these cool features, and Apple go, nah, we're good. Nah. We're good. We're going to stick <laughs> to what we know. <laughs> Tried and true, baby. Flip phone. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> it's just so stupid. Like, it's it just, come on. It, like you said, it should all be open and, and all about learning and exploring our origins Bro, if I found something like that, I would be so stoked. That's what I'm saying. It'd be fucking awesome. I would be so stoked. It would be so much fun just to find anything, a coin like that or oh, yeah. especially, anything. Especially something once you start to get looking into it and you're like, this this shouldn't be like this. Right. This is like, and find it with the weird like esoteric symbols in it and shit. That'd be so Oh, it'd be gangster. You'd, you'd be sitting there. It'd be gangster. You'd be like, this is fucking Freemason shit right here. Like, this is crazy <laughs> hidden knowledge. Like, I don't know. This is this is awesome. It's a little it's a little not cool that it's made out of lead, because lead's not that great. But however, neither is Freemason. I feel like as long as you wash your hands and don't put it in your mouth, make a should be okay. What am I trying to say here? A Tony Stark suit? Yes, a grill with it. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's definitely safe. Yes, yes. I was going to make a safe. chain with a big pendant, but then I thought, it's lead, might as well make Put it in your grill. mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Arizona, you wild. Next, we're going to the city of Flagstaff. Been there. Where? A group of, or wow, a group of workers were driving near Flagstaff, Arizona, 
when they encountered what they can only describe as a centaur that suddenly ran out into what? the highway. It resulted in the heart attack of one of the men that saw the incident. So the person telling the story, one of my cousin's brothers told me this story. He works in construction and he told me a story about three of his friends that he works with. Uh, one of the three of them is an older guy. The story takes place east of Flagstaff, Arizona, heading toward Lep, L-E-U-P-P, Leup, Lep. Uh, I would say about 20 miles from Flagstaff. There's a lot of hills in that area. There's a stretch of highway that goes down one of these long hills. The three guys were driving from Flagstaff one night. I don't remember where they said they were going, but it was late and the older man was driving. They started down at the long hill. When they were halfway down, they witnessed something very crazy and weird. They saw a centaur, half man, half horse, jump into the center of the road. They said it was very big, at least seven to eight feet tall. It had long hair and it was carrying a wooden club in one hand. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? They said it had a very mean, evil looking face. The sight of it freaked them out, and the guy that was driving swerved the truck off the road, and they rolled the truck. No way. Hit that thing. They crawled out of the vehicle, and the older guy that was driving began to have a heart attack. They called 911, and as soon as they were taken to Flags, and as soon as they got there, they were taken to Flagstaff Medical Center. They didn't tell anyone about what they witnessed because they feared nobody would believe them. The older man recovered, and they all kept asking each other if they really saw a centaur. They all agreed that they saw it. My, they told my cousin about it, and he said that he went to a Navajo medicine man. He asked the medicine man about it. The man told him that this is true. He said there are seven centaurs that people have seen over the years. The one they saw with the long hair is the evil one, the mean one. I've heard stories that friends told me when we were kids growing up. I wasn't sure if they were real, but after hearing this, I think that they are. My cousin said that the three men are still traumatized by the experience, and they said they will never travel that road again during the night. Bro, that's wild. <laughs> that is wild. I did not expect the centaur to be hanging out in Arizona, saying. let alone seven of them. Which brings me to my question. Why is there only seven? Because this one beat the hell out of all the other ones. Probably. He's got that long got uh, that hair metal fucking... Style going on. Got a club. He keeps that thing on him. Beating. <laughs> <laughs> Just out there whacking people. Dude, I, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going in here. This is now, I ridiculous. Wanna, I want to text Sean Clinton and be like, yo. Bro, centaurs. Yeah. Tell us about the centaurs. The seven centaurs. We need this because, like, that's you like an old school metal band. Name. Our, our Navajo go to. We need to hear about seven the centaurs. Seven centaurs. Let's, let's get it. All Sky, no, Sean I, dude, Part Two. That would be fucking crazy centaurs. if he's like, he's like, well, oh yeah, actually, I, yeah. yeah, actually. You mean you guys didn't know about centaurs? <laughs> I'm gonna that? be like, what the fuck? You don't have centaurs? In your life? I think, I think I did have a centaur sighting in Illinois, or was a minotaur? I can't remember. Yeah, we did. I know that we've. I think it's minotaur. Oh yeah, I think yeah. it was minotaur. Yeah. So I mean, same thing though. Yeah. It's definitely the same thing. How crazy? I don't even know. And it's eight feet tall, half horse, half dude. Bro, I'm saying I probably would have had a heart attack driving and not swerved and smashed right into that thing. Okay, what's more terrifying? Seeing a regular centaur horse body man man half up here with a club or seeing a reverse centaur where you've got man body with the top body of a horse running around eight feet tall? The The opposite. With the horse upper half, that's yeah. way scarier. Watching him like just a man crawling around and all galloping on all fours is awful. Yeah. Does it okay? Uh, reverse centaur. Does it walk on all fours or does it stand up, walk like a man, and then also have the horse half? I feel like it walks like a man and has the horse <laughs> like arms. It's just out <laughs> there doing its thing. Swim, it's like air swimming like a dog. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, centaur. I feel like I'm way more scared of that one because that one makes way less sense. Yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, just, I Not would. that an actual centaur makes sense, but that one makes way less sense. It's weird that you hear about these that are from like ancient mythology and people yeah. are seeing them. It makes you wonder if, uh, well, I mean, I don't know. If maybe Bro, they were watch more, onward. Yeah, if maybe they were more prevalent back then than they are now, but some of these still exist 
or if they are creatures from another realm that sometimes just kind of bop themselves through. People in Arizona, uh, if you've seen a centaur, get at us. Yeah, be be careful out there. Don't be getting whacked in the head by some centaur. <laughs> um, next, uh, northwestern Arizona dog man. An Arizona man is setting up his camera gear in order to capture shots of a blood moon. He began hearing odd, odd noises and came face to face with an unknown bear-sized canid creature. Uh, this is from Lon Strickler's uh, Lon Strickler's Phantom Phantoms and Monsters. And Monsters. Yes. They say I recently received the following account. So the year was 2010 and there was going to be a blood moon. I rounded up a bunch of equipment to get a good picture of it. I love the moon and my favorite times have all happened under its pale light. Borrowed an awesome camera that could be attached to a telescope. Had my laptop and various other equipment, but also strapped my 40 caliber pistol because there are mountain lions and coyotes in the area, northwest Arizona. Loaded all my gear into my Jeep and headed to an area a few miles away from the town. I get to the place where I'm going to set up, begin unloading, setting up everything, and hearing uh, the nearby sheep start to freak out. Didn't think much of it, and after a handful of minutes, they went quiet again. Just as I was unloading the scope, I hear a very loud splash, and for some reason this caught my attention. I stood up and looked toward the creek for a second, but I didn't hear anything else. So I went back to setting up the scope. Now I hear some rustling, twigs snapping, that sort of thing. I stand up and shine my flashlight around to see what I can see. I don't see anything, and whatever it was went quiet when I shine the light around. I figured I'd scared it off and started screwing the scope onto the tripod when I heard a very loud snap and whipped back around while pulling my gun and shining my light toward a falling tree I'd noticed earlier. And there it was, roughly the size of a bear, but the head was more canid than ursid, and the body was more lean. We stood there staring at each other for what felt like forever. Then it growled, and it charged at me. I screamed and fired my gun repeatedly. After the fact, I found that I'd fired eight shots. It bowled me over, and I fully expected that my life was going to end there. But instead of following through with the attack, it just kept running and disappeared into a nearby cornfield. Thoroughly spooked, I tossed the most expensive bits I had unpacked into my Jeep and left immediately, only going back once the sun was fully up to finish recollecting my gear. When I got there, I found a game warden, a couple sheriff's deputies, and the farmer that owned the field and the pasture. Apparently, whatever it was had killed a couple of sheep, and they were trying to figure out what it was and where it went. The tracks were both canid, but also not canid. They were strangely longer than a standard dog print. What was it? I'm still not sure, but it still keeps me up at night. Some have suggested a dog man, but I'm not sure I believe in such things. The person who wrote it signed BJ. Bro, you better start believing in such things. Yeah, you were just... You about became dinner. You just dinner. got clotheslined from hell yeah. by a dog man. Because that's where I went. Like The description is almost dead on of dog man. Mm-hmm. He just got lucky where it just trucked him instead of... Yeah, like trucked that, him. Yeah. Yeah, that could have been a really bad night for you, man. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Squeezing off them rounds probably helped a little bit, too, because it probably put it in more of a, a flight mode instead of fight, because yeah. it probably stung pretty bad. I'm, I'm curious if there was, like, a blood trail or something, which, I mean, you would think that the game wardens and stuff would find if they're already following tracks. Um, that's pretty ballsy of the thing. I know I mean, game wardens should know damn near every animal that's in the area. Oh, yeah. Especially when he sees those tracks and he's like, man, that's a big dog. Yeah, we need to find this. A, that's like a size 13 dog print. I got two more for you here. Hollow Colt, a short one and a longer one. This is another one from Tucson. I found this one on Reddit, which is strange kind of an abduction story, which, I mean, Arizona's got a lot of UFO activity. Oh, yeah. Lots. Lots of UFOs and portals and, like, Sedona and all this, like, that's a weird place. So, this is from, oh, I thought I could cap the Redditor's name. Uh, yeah, from Redditor U slash John Bronington. It's titled One Night in Arizona. 
When I was 24, living in Tucson, Arizona, I had something unexplainable happen. I'd just seen this sub for the first time and always wanted to put this out there, so here it is. I was working construction in Arizona. It was fall and about 70 degrees at nighttime. My buddy and I had just got done working on a multifamily development outside of Yuma on the way to Tucson. We parked the pickup off a dirt road on a ridge overlooking the desert floor. We had uh, to be about 15 minutes from Interstate 8. We both cracked a beer, don't drink and drive kids, and watched for the imminent and beautiful Arizona sunset. All of a sudden, two to four miles in the distance, I saw a large cylindrical structure, maybe a vehicle, appear on the desert floor. We both saw this and didn't say much besides what the fuck is that. The thing... Imagine a giant bullet sitting upright, illuminated with a very bright light. Then a spiral spiral walkway appeared and ran down the object from the top. We began to see numerous small outlines walking down the ramp that I assumed to be humans. We were both speechless. It happened so fast. Only about 45 to 60 seconds had taken place. Staring at these figures walking down the ramp, they all abruptly stopped and disappeared. That's the last thing we remember. What I can only describe is similar to getting knocked out in a fight. I just ceased being conscious. I woke up at 6.30 the next morning, sitting in my car with my buddy and shotgun 90 miles away in Tucson, a block from my driveway. We both never talked about it because no one would believe my story. But that was the only thing that's happened in my life that I cannot explain and has led me to be much more open-minded. Well, that sounds like a pretty shitty experience. Yeah, that's classic uh, abduction scenario there. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. Dude, that would just be miserable. Out there just checking it out, and the next thing you know, like, you just, I woke up. It's got to be such a surreal feeling. You know what I mean? Like, we're... It'd It'd be terrible. You'd almost think... I feel like you'd almost think that I was literally dreaming and I had this most vivid dream and now I'm woke up, but I'm still not where I'm supposed to be. Like, What is going on? Yeah. And I mean, two to four miles, it, you would think it'd be pretty far to see a human, but maybe it wasn't as far as he thought because I mean, Probably. The, the fact of them getting like that, like... <laughs> It's so, like, I almost picture this, the way he described it as the bullet with the spiral and all these entities walking down it, and then they just stop. Almost like they turned and looked where they were. Right. And then disappeared. Lights out. Yeah. As soon as the thing disappeared, then they wake up. There's terrifying connotations, too, considering he woke up just minutes, f- like a block from his driveway. So almost yeah. like these things know, knew yeah, where he lived. They have to be, like, they have to have the ability to root through your brain. Which is awful. Well, yeah, it's disgusting. It is awful. Not to mention, how disgusted do you think they get from time to time? Yeah. When the aliens are rooting around in your brain, like, God dang, this guy's weirdo. Yeah. This dude watches some weird shit on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last one I got here is a longer one, but it is an interesting story that I came across on uh, Paranormal Arizona. Uh, I just titled it Portals in the Mountains. So this is the accounts of a treasure hunter named Ron Quinn. He and his friends visited this mysterious canyon during a two-year adventure into southern Arizona in search of lost mines and hidden Spanish treasures. Uh, the terrain they had discovered, or when they were checking out the terrain, they had discovered a location where essentially time itself is altered. This natural freak of nature exists deep within a region of the mountain range seldom visited by people. The story began in early 1956 and still remains a memory to this day. The reason Ron came forward even to tell what he experienced is because he said something is in the works that may affect this time portal. 
the Tucson Electric Power Company plans on building a 345,000 watt high voltage transmission line from Tucson to Nogales. The line would come almost directly through this site. When the line becomes active, what if all the electric all the electricity has an effect on this specific site or if they've got workers who don't know that this thing is could possibly um, put them at risk. So everything that Ron's getting ready to tell us here happened around this specific uh, location. He goes on to say, after being discharged from the military, I was approached by my brother Chuck with an intriguing proposition. He asked if I would be interested in embarking on an extended trip to Arizona to search for several of the legendary lost treasures that were allegedly hidden during the Spanish occupation. I was immediately intrigued by the idea, and we began making plans. With the help of our parents, we saved enough money for two years. At the time, I was 23 years old, and Chuck was 26. On March 20th, 1956, we left Tacoma, Washington, and headed towards uh, Aravaca, Arizona. The small desert hamlet of around 70 residents was located in the heart of the country and was known to harbor some of these well-known hidden treasures. After three weeks of treasure hunting, Chuck and I were relaxing at our campsite one evening. We noticed two large balls of blue-green light slowly descending from behind the Tumacarcori Mountains to the south. These lights were not flares, as no sound of aircraft had broken the silence of the night. Both vanished within minutes. The following night, at precisely the same time, 8.05 p.m., the lights appeared again in the exact identical location. These also disappeared behind the peaks. Several days later, Louis Romero, a local cowboy who rode for the Ava, or the Aravaca Ranch, stopped by our campsite. Over several weeks, we became friends with him and learned a great deal about the area's history. While in Aravaca, we heard from the locals that if Louis tells you something, you can bet your life it's the truth. During one of his weekly visits, Louis told us many stories centering around the nearby mountains, several bordered on the paranormal. After describing the odd lights we had seen, he smiled and said that he and others had spotted them since 1939 in the same location. Over the mountains, we saw them several more times. One day, while returning to Aravaca, we noticed an old truck parked beside the road with a flat tire. The gentleman stood behind his vehicle trying to hitch a ride to the nearest service station. Since we did not have a spare tire, we offered him a ride to the Kinsley Ranch and gas station. After having the tire repaired, we returned John to his truck where, he where we mounted the tire for him. John was grateful for our help as not many people had shown him such kindness. A month or so later at camp, we were surprised to see him approaching us on horse horseback. He told us he was working temporarily for a local ranch and checking the fence lines. While talking in general about the surrounding country, Chuck mentioned that we were treasure hunting. As a boy, John said he'd heard many tales of lost missions of gold and silver. He also believed that some of the tales were true, as treasure was found in 1907 near Nogales. Later, John told us about a mysterious stone archway also called the doorway to the gods. Ray told him that we came across such a formation south of camp. John's first words were, did you walk through its opening? Walt, another guy at our camp, answered, no. We noticed, we noticed it while descending a slope, but paid little attention to the oddity. John then told us that around eight, the 1800s, three indigenous men were hunting upon returning, or were hunting, and upon returning to their village, they discovered this stone archway. Uh, being in, in kind of an exciting mood, you know, they were coming back from their hunt. They began messing around, chasing one and one another through the opening of this uh, archway. Moments later, one jumped through, but never came through the opposite side. Fearing that they had just entered some sort of sacred ground of the gods, the remaining two fled the scene. Arriving at their village, they told the medicine man how their friend had vanished before their eyes. Um, Chuck Quinn goes on to talk about uh, examining geodes from the site in 1956. As the story spread, other journey to the plateau to check out the stone structure. Rocks and other items were tossed through, but nothing occurred. 
until one day an elderly woman approached, tossing a a live rabbit through it. The rabbit vanished and did not come through the other side. Uh, John himself had been to the site on many occasions. The only time he witnessed anything strange was around 1948. A big storm had blown in and the sky was filled with dark clouds in all directions. As he rose, p- rode past the archway, he noticed the sky through its opening was blue and no clouds were visible. Dismounting, he walked cautiously toward the formation and peered through it. The mountains on the other side hadn't changed, but the sky was absolutely clear. Looking around the corner of the structure, the sky was covered with dark clouds. As he was watching this, fear just over, overtook him. He got on his horse and rode off. Some believe that John was looking into another timeline or another dimension through a portal. When we ask him if the story was indeed true, why hadn't it been investigated, he replied that only his people knew of the story as it had never been mentioned outside of his tribe. The only reason he told us was because we had shown him the kindness while he was stranded by the highway. Curious, we decided to make another trip to the remote site with a man named Roy Purdy and Walter Fisher, two fellow treasure hunters who were camping with us. It was a rugged climb, and the torturous craggy mountains did us no favors. Entering their domain and make an error, and you'll be added to the list of the injured or missing. The mysterious area is covered with windswept rock formations that dot the landscape. Searching further, we discovered an enormous deposit of geodes. The ground was littered with them. Some had been broken open, revealing their crystalline interiors. As we approached the archway, the structure took on a menacing appearance. It stood beside a rocky slope and was perhaps seven feet tall and seven feet wide. Its columns measured approximately 15 inches in diameter and were made of andesite. Chuck jokingly tossed several rocks through, but nothing happened. Next, I placed my arm in. Roy, the superstitious member of our foursome, said I was flirting with danger if the story was true. Knowing his nature toward the unknown, I decided to play a joke. I suddenly yelled like something was pulling me through. Jumping back, I began laughing as Roy cussed me out. By by now, we were all close friends, so no offense was taken. After several hours, we departed this interesting location carrying a number of geodes. I remember glancing back at this part of the world, wondering if there was truly something within the area that could alter time at random. Was it just the archway itself, or were there unknown natural forces at play? We would definitely discover the answer, at least to the time-altering questions. Later on, it was roundup time at the Aravaca Ranch. That evening, Louie and several others were camping beside the corral just north of the mountains to get an early start the following morning. As they sat around having coffee and making small talk, Louis noticed how still the night was. Most evenings, one could hear the night sounds of the desert, but this night it was unusually quiet. The livestock and the livestock seemed restless. As they were about to bed down, they suddenly heard the rumbling approaching of horses. As the sound grew closer, one could hear the clattering of hooves amongst the rocks, accompanied by the whinnying of many horses. As the sound increased, the boys dove for cover, expecting to see a herd of wild horses stampeding through the camp but as the rumbling reached the opposite side of a nearby canyon, it disappeared. The following morning, they searched and found no evidence of any horses at all. Louis mentioned wild horses once roamed the countryside around the turn of the century. Were Louis and the others caught on some sort of uh, time alteration? It turns out they were... Or it turns out they were near our mysterious archway. Before continuing, I'd like to set forth a theory told to us uh, by a party of well-versed in the field of strange and paranormal. Perhaps an enormous deposit of ye- geodes beneath the surface might be affecting time in some mysterious manner. When all the natural elements, the vibration of the crystals, the electricity in the atmosphere, and the magnetic fields of the earth come together at a precise moment, laws of nature are turned topsy-turvy, and things occur beyond our understanding. It could be like dropping a stone into a pool of calm water. The archway being the stone and the waves expanding outward could be the natural forces. These might reach anywhere from several yards to a mile. The sun was setting as I reached the top top of the hill. The archway stood before me. Its imposing presence cast an eerie shadow over the surrounding landscape. I had been here before, but never alone. This time there was no one to share this experience with, no one to witness what was about to happen to me. 
As I approached the archway, I could feel a strange energy emanating from it. The air was thick with anticipation, and I felt a sense of dread creeping over me. I knew that I was about to cross a threshold, to enter a realm beyond my understanding. I took a deep breath, and I stepped through the archway. In an instant, the world around me changed. The familiar landscape of the canyon was gone, replaced by a strange and unfamiliar world. The trees were larger and taller, the mountains more rugged, and the air was filled with a sense of an ancient power. I was lost. I wandered through this alien world for what seemed like hours, yelling for help, but my voice was swallowed up by the vastness of the wilderness. As darkness fell, I knew that I had to find shelter before night. I stumbled upon a cave and crawled inside. Shriv shivering from the cold, I lay there in the darkness. I could hear strange noises all over the place, the sounds of unseen creatures moving through the night. I closed my eyes and I tried to fall asleep, but the fear was too great. I lie awake, or I lay awake all night listening to the sounds and wondering if I would ever see my home or my friends again. At first light, I emerged from the cave and began to make my way back to the archway. I knew that if I could just find my way back, I could return to my own world. After what seemed like an eternity, I finally reached the archway. I took a deep breath and stepped through. In an instant, I was back in the familiar world of the canyon. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and I was safe. I had no idea how long I'd been gone, but it felt like a lifetime. I had experienced something that I could never imagine, something that defied all logic and reason, and I knew that I would never be the same again. That's a wild one. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's definitely wild, but you hear... It's that's not the only place you hear of these archways either. No. You hear them across the planet. Yeah, I'm trying to think where we had heard this. Iran or Iraq. But there's somewhere Stargates. There massive, yeah. And we had uh we had a listener experience about about not necessarily a stone archway portal, but a similar kind of portal uh close to here. Yeah. Which is strange that it essentially only affects living creatures. Like maybe something in in the vibrations we're putting off or in the electrical currents through our body maybe uh, help us slip through the realms Could. of these these timelines. Or that's that's if it was a timeline. Was was he transported to uh 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, or was he transported to another dimension, an alternate dimension? Well, there's also there's also something to be said about whatever compelled him to not only go through the archway, but then to continue to carry on. Yeah, that was kind of my thought, too. Like, he stepped through when all you had to do was turn around and step back through, essentially. Logically, yes. Which kind of was kind of threw me off a little bit unless when he stepped through he wasn't near the portal anymore that's kind of yeah that's kind of where my like brain like in Beetlejuice was. where they go through the, the door with the sandworm mm -hmm. and when they're put there they're, the door's they're just not there, there yeah they're yeah. just there it's strange and it could that could be the case it could also be that curiosity got the best of him that day when he walked through he's like holy shit oh yeah you know like and then you then you go exploring and before you know it you don't exactly realize how far away you've gotten from said doorway or whatever else, you know? So you, you might've been like, uh Oh, I've got to try to figure out how to get back to That'd where, be the worst. Oh dude, it'd be terrible. That would be the worst. I don't, I couldn't imagine. I, I don't know. I think my gut in crossing over would be like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back now because I don't know where I'm at. I have, and like you said, like it doesn't feel right. Like, yeah, he didn't even elaborate on if there was time change. Yeah, if there was a, a huge loss in time because he didn't know exactly. Which I mean, at the point of telling the story, he probably knew. Yeah, I would, would I would imagine, but would have been interesting to follow up. Like, did he show up seven days later? Or did he show up thirty minutes later? Right. You know? It's it's strange, man. Because you you would assume that there would be time distortion between timelines or things like that you know what i mean like yeah. if there's time distortion between this side of the planet and the other side well then surely different dimensions yeah it'd be a little different and yeah it's so weird it's so weird um it reminds me of one of the first things that like the first things we ever talked about with tony was portals and he asked us if there was a portal 
right in front of you and you didn't know where it was going, would you go through it? I said, yep. I'd probably, I'd probably at least, I don't know what I would do. Just poke your head through. Yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't say that I would or I wouldn't. I don't know. I would have to be compelled in the moment. Like it, it's the moment that would matter most for me. Yeah. I, yeah. You'd almost have to my decision. feel it out. Like, yeah. Our buddy here, he said he immediately started feeling senses of dread and yeah, not good, just anxiety. And he's like, eh, I'm just gonna go for it. Which I mean, kudos that, to him. Off. He's got a got a sack, right? He's got a sack, right? But I think if I approached it, if I approached it and I didn't get bad vibes, and I was like, my curiosity was there, I would go through. But if I got there and I was like, man, this feels like it's gonna suck. Something's off. Yeah, this yeah, feels like I'm it's going to be out. terrible. I'm probably not going to do this. That's where I'm at. Like, I just, I don't know. I'm pretty good at following my gut. And if I'm if I'm vibing not good vibes, I'm going to be like, all right, I'm out of here. Yeah, it's a it's a portal by portal basis, you know? Right. You right. got to feel them out. As foolish as it sounds, that that is a pretty accurate description. You got to feel them out. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. But yeah, those are just some... Uh, Stories I stumbled upon that weren't very well uh, versed. I'd never heard of them. I'm very interested in the archway, though. It would be awesome to go see it. Yes. If anybody knows, let me go back. Did he say exactly where he was? I don't think so. No, I don't either. Was it just Northwest Arizona? Oh, he said he's in the Aravaca. So somewhere in Yeah, somewhere in there, but Arizona. If anybody is familiar with that spot, traipses around the desert. I think it would be amazing just to see. Like it didn't. It wouldn't even have to be paranormal to see some archway. Oh yeah, that'd be sick. Built out there like that, whether it's man-made or naturally formed, would be fucking wild. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That would be so. Awesome. And then and then come to find out if you walk through it and you're in a whole different place, well. I'd say your day just got a whole lot more interesting. Yeah, that would be dope. Yeah, if anybody knows about it or is close to Aravaca, Arizona, and have traped through the uh, desert and the canyons out there and have seen this archway, let us know and also walk through it to see what happens. That being said, that's the end of 1450 Arizona. Hope you had a good time. I hope my people in Arizona don't encounter any centaurs because that yeah. one sound pissed. Yeah. Remember, he's got that thing on him. You don't wanna you don't wanna catch one of them up the side of the head. Uh, but check us out at all social medias, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Discord, Reddit. Hang out with us here on Mondays. The night shift for December. Monday nights, YouTube, 8 p.m. Central. Come and kick it. Uh, the audio version of Night Shift drops on Tuesdays and our listener experiences drop on Thursdays. Until we meet again, Holocult, stay safe, stay weird, and watch for time portals and centaurs. <laughs>